Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless john 15 18 through 20 if the world hates you you know that it hated me before it hated you if you were of the world the world would love its own yet because you're not of the world but i chose you out of the world therefore the world hates you remember the word that i said to you a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me they will also persecute you. Well, now to the latest legal battle that's been going on since 2017. The owner of, a ca of Kathy's Creations and Tasteries, Kathy Miller, was taken to court by the state of California after she refused to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex couple because of her religious beliefs. A lower court judge ruled in her favor, and now she is hoping an appeals court will do the very same. Let's bring in Kathy Miller and her attorney, senior counsel at Beckett, Adele Kime. Thank you both for coming on. We very much appreciate it. Kathy, to you first, tell us why you're fighting this. I mean, wh why is this so important for you? Because a lot of people, we've seen these types of cases, said, why not just bake the thing for, for the same-sex marriage? Thank you, Trace, for asking. Um, baking the cake um, for an LGBT couple would be in violation of my deeply held religious convictions. And uh, the Bible states very clearly that um, there's things that I should and should not do. And I love my Lord and Savior, and I'm not going to hurt him. And so I could not bake the cake. I arranged for another bakery to do an excellent job on any cakes that I couldn't bake. And um, when I offered that to this couple, um, they rejected it. But the sad thing is, is that the state of California is choosing to continuously yeah. discriminate against me by not even interviewing me or talking to me before they took me to court. I look at this and I thought, and a lot of people that I know thought the same thing, like, didn't we settle this? Didn't the Supreme Court partially rule in favor of Jack Phillips and the Masterpiece Cake Shop in, in Colorado that ended this whole thing? Absolutely, Trace. That's what a lot of people are asking themselves, and California should be asking itself that, too. Look, the Supreme Court has ruled not once but twice in the past five years in favor of wedding vendors like Kathy that have deeply held religious beliefs. But California just doesn't get the message, Trace. It spent six years investigating her. It put her through a full trial on the merits. And do you know what they found after all of that effort to prosecute Kathy? Yeah. They found nothing. They, they found, found nothing. nothing. The district court said... She had, there was no evidence that she discriminated against anyone in the LGBT community. It found that she employed people in the community. It found that she served people in the community. And it held that the only intent that she had in all of this was to do, was to follow her own deeply held religious beliefs. Uh, have you thought about what you will do if this goes to the appeals court? In fact, it will. If you lose at the appeals court, what is next for you? Do you, do you acquiesce? What's happening? I will continue to follow the path God has before me, and I'm going to trust my lawyers to take this where it needs to go, and I'm going to trust that our government will come through and recognize our constitutional rights as well as our deeply held religious convictions. It's amazing to me because, you know, they were saying, oh, you know, the, this is comparing your beliefs about marriage to racism. But you have made it very clear, Kathy, that you won't bake anything that has anything to do with promoting racism or, or gory stuff or anything. So that's part of this whole process. And I wonder, Adele, if, if you know, if you think there might be ulterior motives for the people bringing this case, why not just accept the other baker? Somebody's going to bake your cake for you. Accept it. Thank Kathy. Move Move on and, and, and have a great life. Listen, Trace, the biggest bully on the playground here is the state of California. They're the ones who have gone to court again and again. They're the ones who have used inflammatory comparisons, who have denigrated her religious beliefs, who have said that her beliefs are an affront to the dignity of all Californians. Listen, if, if Kathy's belief that she has to do what her Lord and Savior asks her to do, no matter what, is an affront to the dignity of no. all Californians, all Californians, and California needs to get another idea of human dignity. Yep. Kathy, for your final thoughts, I've got 15 seconds. Is it worth it? It is worth it. It is worth it to stand in love 
and respect each other and work together so that everybody is served, but you don't have to give up your faith or honoring our Lord. The Christian persecution the church is suffering right now, awful as it is, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, the greatest political leader in the history of mankind will take the world stage. He will launch a military campaign that will result in his acquiring authority over all peoples of the earth as we read in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His empire will be the most extensive in all of history, encompassing the entire world, and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will appear to be the savior of the world, but as he consolidates his power, his true nature will be revealed. He will emerge as a Satan-possessed and empowered person who hates God and is determined to annihilate Christianity. His method of eliminating Christians will be by beheading as we read in Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. For this reason, he is identified in Scripture as the Antichrist as we read in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. The Bible indicates that there will be a great apostasy during the end times, as we read in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Falling away is the Greek word apostasia, which means defection from the truth, properly the state, apostasy. Apostasia, from which we get the English word apostasy, refers to a general defection from the true God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. The end times will include a rejection of God's word, a further falling away of an already fallen world. Shocking rise of the nuns. More American adults are responding nothing in particular when asked about their religious affiliation. According to Pew Research, the nuns are now the largest group at 28 percent. Well, here to provide some insights on why this is happening is Christian youth, religion and culture analyst Alex McFarland. Alex, always good to have you with us. So. Why are we seeing this alarming growth of religious unaffiliation in American culture? We're seeing the most recent numbers in trends that have been working for a couple of decades. And there, there are a number of factors, just uh, the denial of truth, the real erosion of churches, you know, preaching the word of God, black and white, sin, redemption, repentance, righteousness, but really the largest contributing factor to the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, when asked what, what religion or what, what God do you believe in, the answer is none. The largest contributing factor is the breakdown of the family. What does this say about the current state of American churches? Is the church affecting the culture or the culture of the church? Well, at this point, unfortunately, the culture is much more steering the church than the church steering the culture, which is not what Christ intended. Uh, you know, in uh, Matthew uh, 25 and other scriptures, you know, Jesus talked about us being salt and light, and uh, you don't put light under a, a basket to hide it. You let the light illuminate the landscape. Here's the thing. In the home, within the context of family, we learn accountability, we learn punishment, reward, grace, uh, accountability, but we also learn structure. And nuns, I find this in so many uh, with middle school, high school, uh, colleges, young people, they might say, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And they do think about God, and they're very open to the gospel, obviously. But here's the thing. The majority of young people nowadays, 60 percent and, and higher, have never lived under the same roof with mom and dad, their biological mother and father. And the conventional wisdom is that the culture became liberal and then the family broke down. But in reality, 55 to 60 years of data show this, 
that as the family broke down, that's when it opened the door for the embrace of liberal ideas and, frankly, secular ideas. If you want to restore Christianity, which is the key to restoring America, we need to become a champion for the family. And by family, what I mean is the the family structure that God initiated and ordained, a husband and a wife for a lifetime, a mother and a father raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As goes the family, so goes the church. And as goes the church, so goes the nation. God created the family. His design was for a man and a woman to marry for life and raise children to know and honor him, as we read in Mark 10, 6 through 9. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Children are a gift from God, and he cares about how they are raised. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. When God led the Israelites out of bondage, he commanded them to teach their children all he had done for them, as we read in Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. God desired that the generations to come would continue to uphold all his commands. When one generation fails to instill God's laws in the next, a society quickly declines. Parents have not only a responsibility to their children, but an assignment from God to impart his values and truth into their lives. God disciplines his children, as we read in Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? God expects earthly parents to discipline their children as well, as we read in Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Children are a heritage from the Lord, as we read in Psalm 127, 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, The fruit of the womb is a reward. The goal of good parenting is to produce wise children who know and honor God with their lives. Proverbs 23, 24 shows the end result of raising children according to God's plan. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a wise child will delight in him. Failure to discipline results in dishonor for both parent and child. As we read in Proverbs, 10.1. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Proverbs 15.32 says, He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. The Lord brought judgment upon Eli the priest because he allowed his sons to dishonor the Lord and failed to restrain them, as we read in 1 Samuel 3.13. For I have told him, that I would judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. God tells us what happens if we forget his law in Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Because America has rejected God's knowledge and forgotten his law, It seems as though God has forgotten our children. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, 
apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. The U.S. airstrikes in the Middle East, U.S. Central Command saying more than 85 targets in seven locations were hit, all in response to the drone attack that killed three Americans. This is new aftermath video coming in from overnight. U.S. officials say this retaliation is meant to send a message to Iranian-backed militants without escalating the situation here. But more strikes are expected, and this region is bracing for what's next. Overnight, the U.S. following through on its promise, launching strikes against Iranian-backed militant groups. Officials say they hit 85 targets at seven different locations inside Iraq and Syria. These images showing the destruction. Iraqi officials say 16 people were killed and more than 25 hurt. In a statement, U.S. Central Command said the targets included command and control operations centers, rockets, missiles, and drone storage facilities that belong to the militant groups and Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. We believe that the strikes were successful. The strikes, retaliation for the drone attack that killed three U.S. service members at Tower 22 in northeastern Jordan on January 28th. The reservist bodies returned to the U.S. Friday in a solemn ceremony attended by President Biden and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. The three service members, part of the Army's 718th Engineer Company. Officials say the strikes overnight are just the start of a wave of retaliation meant to send a message and reduce the militant group's capabilities to launch attacks. The strikes adding to fears of a wider regional conflict. Iraq's armed forces releasing a statement saying the strikes are a violation of the country's sovereignty and they threaten the security and stability across the region. There is a clear sense this morning from the reaction that's coming overnight that a concern about this war spreading has only increased. And I think it's, it's really important to remember what is fueling a lot of this, and that's the war in Gaza. And the belief here is that as long as it continues, that stability in the region remains at risk. Pentagon officials say since the Israel-Hamas war broke out in October, Iran-backed militia groups launched more than 165 attacks on U.S. military sites in Iraq and Syria. There are constant fears the war could spread to a new front on Israel's northern border, a potential conflict with Iran-backed Hezbollah in Lebanon. If Iran escalates, it's unlikely to strike the U.S. directly, but one possibility would be through its proxy, Hezbollah, into northern Israel. Israeli forces are on the ready, a few miles from the Lebanese border. They've been trading fire with Iranian-backed Hezbollah fighters since the Hamas attack on October 7th. We visited the region this week. We can't stay here long. We're directly in the line of fire of Hezbollah lookout points. They could fire at any time. And they do. This village was hit just Monday. Increasingly, there has been a lot of saber rattling. Israeli troops have been sent to reinforce the north, and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has threatened to turn Beirut into Gaza. While Hezbollah's leader Hassan Nasrallah has warned that if Israel wages war against them, it will be very costly. But a war with Hezbollah would be very different than the fight against Hamas. Hezbollah has an arsenal of over 150,000 missiles, which security experts say is five times larger and far more accurate than Hamas. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey 
will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. North Korea launches its fourth weapons test in just over a week, firing cruise missiles into the sea. Tests carried out in the past month include ones on a hypersonic missile and new submarine-launched cruise missile. On Friday, state media also released photos of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un inspecting the construction of warships in a shipyard in the city of Nampo. Kim reportedly said strengthening the navy is an important part of Pyongyang's preparations for war. He stepped up his rhetoric in recent months. Kim is also pursuing stronger ties with Russia, raising concerns Moscow could help Pyongyang strengthen its nuclear weapons program. South Korea's response has been to seek closer military cooperation with the U.S. and Japan. Last month, the three countries conducted possibly their biggest ever combined naval exercise. Just recently, elite units from South Korea and the U.S. held a joint training drill, simulating infiltration of enemy territory and directing airstrikes to destroy a target. The Ukrainian intelligence service published a video saying it showed an Ukrainian naval drone successfully attacking a Russian warship near Crimea. According to Ukrainian media, Russian search and rescue operations in the area were unsuccessful, implying all crew members died. Moscow has not issued any comments on the incident yet. Officials in Ukraine said Moscow has been refusing to hand over the bodies of those who were on board the transport plane that was shot down near Belgorod, despite Kyiv's demands. The United Nations on Thursday said a recent Russian strike against the Ukrainian city of Kherson hit a humanitarian hub ran by a local NGO, among other targets. Luke 21:25, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Tonight, the streets of Argentina erupting in chaos. Thousands converging on the capital in Buenos Aires to protest a controversial bill proposed by the newly elected president. Police seen battling crowds with pepper spray, rubber bullets, even water cannons. Slamming protesters to the ground where some were handcuffed and arrested. The violent clashes, a response to President Javier Mille's omnibus bill, a sweeping plan that would drastically deregulate the country's struggling economy. We know the economy in Argentina was already in a precarious spot, so what is different now? Hyperinflation. And hyperinflation is something that Argentina has not seen in 35 years. So we're talking about inflation levels that make it very difficult to live um, even on a daily basis. Argentina's annual inflation rate is at 211 percent, the highest in more than 30 years, and more than 40 percent of the population lives in poverty. Critics of the bill say it weakens the job security of everyday Argentinians. Mille, a far-right political newcomer who rose to fame as a brash TV pundit, has called for a shock adjustment to Argentina's economy, arguing things have to get worse before they get better. What's at stake here for the average citizen of Argentina? A lot. There is so much contained in this legislation that we're basically talking about every area of a person's life being affected, which is why everyone is really paying attention to this. Entering his presidency not even two months ago, the self-proclaimed anarcho-capitalist has been met with glaring opposition since taking office. Tonight, Malay's austere plans for Argentina's economy, leaving some feeling like they're teetering on the brink of economic survival. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay. Moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture.
Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind, that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal, until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-12 For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Overnight, the brunt of Thursday's storm swamping Southern California, soaking rain, dropping on battered San Diego, still reeling from last week's destructive floods. More than 300 homes and families needing assistance, 65 people in evacuation shelters across the city, 30 roads closed. The county of San Diego is establishing uh, a housing assistance program to connect displaced residents with long-term housing while they wait to get back into their homes. This, along with widespread damage throughout Los Angeles and Orange Counties and swift water rescues across the region. Teams pulling a person from a storm channel in Orange County. And Santa Ana hoisting a man from the middle of a riverbed. Drivers rescued from submerged cars as roadways suddenly turned into waterways. I can open the door, the fire truck came, to pull me out of the window. Thank God they're here. Walkways closed after the earth underneath washed away. This is not a little flood. No, I mean, you see it. Look at the cars. And it's hard to get into your house. And homes waterlogged. It's like a solid three inches of standing water. And even more so over here. That's like a good five inches. Impacts of the Pineapple Express sending tropical moisture from Hawaii to the West Coast. In the north, the Sierra blanketed with snow, up to four feet in some locations. The Russian River overflowing, washing out highways and flooding vineyards. Trees and power lines down across the state. That latest storm may be over, but come Sunday, a second, more powerful storm will impact this area once again. Officials are warning people to get out now, get the supplies you need so you can avoid being on the roads. And a reminder, if you see standing water, do not drive through it. It could be deadly. As we look at the news, there is no doubt we are in the birth pains Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, 8. We see many of God's remedial judgments manifesting as if God is warning us of things to come and calling on people to repent. We see war and rumors of wars, famine, and pestilence resulting in the deaths of thousands around the world. We are seeing earthquakes, extreme heat, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, hailstorms, and hurricanes, all at record levels of frequency and intensity, just like Jesus said would happen just prior to his return. The judgments God will use to punish mankind with during the seven-year tribulation will be much worse than any of us can imagine. Still, this is God's grace and mercy, proving to everyone that these judgments come from him and he is still offering forgiveness of sins through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I implore you to do so today as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. Monday, San Diego got more rain in six hours than they normally get all month forcing some onto their roofs to escape fast rising water. Before I know it's up to my knees and uh, my neighbors and I, we all had to figure out what to do. That's happening in every corner of the U.S. from Fort Lauderdale's staggering floods in April to September when Brooklyn got 30 days of rain in just three hours. That swamped LaGuardia Airport and subway lines across the city. 
and I'm really disgusted by it because you can't even get home. Climate change is driving both these events and the overall trend, with the most destructive floods happening three times as often as they once did. Floods causing more than a billion dollars in damage hit the U.S. on average every 19 months between 1980 and 2009. But since 2010, they're now happening an average of every six months. Last year, there were four. I just never have ever, ever in my 40 years seen it like this. And that is not hyperbole. Climate change is amplifying and accelerating the physics of the water cycle. So the more that humans heat the planet, the thirstier the atmosphere gets, evaporating more water, often dumping that water more quickly, and sometimes all on one community. Like in Southern California, where researchers at Climameter calculated how burning fossil fuel made Monday's storm even wetter, flooding neighborhoods and triggering mudslides. For uh, San Diego area, we find that uh, this increase of precipitation is up to 15 percent more rain during this event due to anthropogenic climate change. It's not just rain over time. It's the heavier rainfall rates themselves, two inch per hour, three inch per hour rates. That's overwhelming the subway, the sewer system. We're just seeing that more and more in all regions across the U.S. that the current infrastructure is not built to handle the climate change as it's occurring right now. Further highlighting the need to adapt is an analysis from nonprofit climate research group First Street Foundation. It found that previously rare floods are happening up to 12 times more often in the areas shaded in the darkest blue, like along the Gulf Coast, where some towns in Texas this week got more than a foot of rain, triggering more widespread flooding. Jesus declares this in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, he is returning. One of the things that parallel our days with the days of Noah is the unprecedented flooding the world has been experiencing over the last few years. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, things will be going on as normal as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation. Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance 
occurred on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.